Jerry, it's so great to have you on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. Thanks for joining me. It is a pleasure, Davey. You know, um, I told you this off air, but I, I really want our community to know that your work, your life, your voice, your story has been so impactful for me. I can't tell you how many times people not only suggested, but also sent your book, A Grace Disguise, to me when I was walking through this horrific tragedy back in 2015. And, you know, for one, it provided a lot of uh, maybe just solidarity that somebody else had gone through something horrific yeah. as well and lost in the, you know, to the degree. And obviously we can't compare losses or pain or anything like that, but lost to a significant degree. But then two, what you brought out of that book and what you, the, the, the truth and the hope that you wrote through that in a very raw and real way that provided just so much comfort and a healing salve to my soul. And so thank you so much. This is such an honor to have this conversation with you. I'm excited to talk about your story, your life, and this this new release, the 25th anniversary of A Grace Disguised. Oh, um, so I know we're going to get into a whole lot of things yeah. as we talk through this. I look forward to it too. Instant chemistry with you is so I can tell this is going to be a good conversation. <laughs> well, likewise, Jerry, I would love, you know, in case our community doesn't know you or your story, can you give us just kind of a brief synopsis that we can use as a springboard to talk about some of these really big truths that you uh, have wrestled with these profound insights that you have brought out in a grace disguise as well as some of your other works. Yeah, I, I was a pastor for 10 years. I married at a young age to Linda. I was uh, 21 at the time, uh, graduated from college, went to Fuller Seminary, was a pastor for 10 years, then got my PhD at the University of Chicago and then took a job at Whitworth University uh, teaching church history. Uh, we moved here in 1989. My wife, Linda, was a homeschooler and uh, a musician, professional musician. And we decided to do a, a field trip in 1991. I went to a Native American powwow. A faculty member at Whitworth was a member of that tribe. We had dinner with the tribal leaders, had a lovely time. Interestingly enough, the problem of alcohol came up hmm. in our conversation with tribal leaders. We attended the powwow after a dinner, and then on our way home, uh, we were hit by a, a drunk driver who was going 85 miles an hour, and uh, mm. he jumped his lane, plowed straight on into us. In fact, his car cartwheeled over ours. And uh, we, we had four children at the time, eight, six, four, and two. My mother was visiting us for mm. uh, the weekend. She was in the car, too. And when the dust settled, uh, my mother, Grace, uh, was killed in the accident. My wife, Linda, my first wife, and uh, my four-year-old daughter, Diana Jane. Uh, his wife also was killed, and she was nine months pregnant, and obviously the uh, baby died too. So it was really a, mm. a horrific experience, uh, just incomprehensible, really. Um, I was injured, but not terribly bad. My two older children were injured, not terribly bad. My my two-year-old was injured much more seriously, but he has since recovered. So in a moment wow. of time, Davey, my entire world was turned upside down. Uh, interesting, yeah. just an anecdote. Um, we have, were at the scene of the accident. It was in rural, rural Idaho, so we were there for a long time. Hmm. And uh, um, then there was another... Uh, hour in the emergency vehicle to get to a, a larger hospital. And all four of us were together, the four survivors. And in that hour, I stared right at it and realized that my entire world would be permanently altered. Yeah. That this was just one of those big events that I could not get behind again. That was yeah. a, a remarkable hour of reflection, probably the most rational hour I've ever had in my life, surprisingly, because it was wow. such an emotional kind of experience. And then I yeah. got busy trying to figure out how to do life under a very different set of circumstances. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, uh, uh, that, that was 30 some years it ago. It was 30 years ago. Right? In fact, we just observed the 30th anniversary last September 27th. I wow. always observe it. You know, I'll write letters to the kids. Yeah. Sometimes we get together. Uh, last uh, fall, I had lunch with my daughter and my son who live in town. My other son lives in Seattle. And we did a lot of reminiscing and laughing. And uh, it was uh, a very interesting conversation I hope we can return to. 
because it was telling yeah, about yeah. kind of the long-term trajectory of a big, big loss like that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I'm sitting here as I'm, I'm going, okay, I get to sit in front of Jerry Sitzer and I get to ask him questions of this like 30 year span of walking this, this journey, walking out this story. You know, I'm seven years into mine of kind of this new, I mean, I, I felt the exact same thing that you felt. This was so big. This was such a monumental turning point and an upending of my life that you couldn't help but go, okay, this is going to drastically change everything about everything of my yeah. life, yeah. right? For very obvious reasons, but then also you could tell kind of, you know, some of the some of the more ethereal reasons, some of the more existential reasons. You're like, this, this, I can't be the same after this. But I was trying to think, how in the world do I boil down, you know, 30 years for you into certain questions to ask, what did you glean from this? I feel like that's such a trite question, you know what I mean? So I'm wondering, because you 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 wrote two chapters, you've released two new chapters for the 25th anniversary yeah. edition of A Grace Disguise. And, and one of those has to do with this idea of looking back over a long period yeah, of time. Yeah, that's right. And, I, and I'm curious, what is it about looking back over a long period of time that has also shifted kind of how how you look forward or, or your perspective, your view on your story? Why is that such a pivotal crucial thing. Well, you really named it, and that is the idea of story itself. So I'm going to give you an anecdote. Uh, when I had lunch with my, uh, my daughter and son last September, uh, I asked them for the first time, this is the first time after the book, since the book came out, how they felt about me writing a book about this big experience of loss. At the time, you know, yeah. they were so young when I wrote it, that it would have been inappropriate for me to ask that question. And of course, the subjects of the book have come up a lot, but I, I finally looked right at, but looked them right in the eye and said, how do you feel about this? My daughter, the oldest, said immediately, oh, it's been so meaningful for, I mean, millions of people now around mm -hmm. the world. It's been translated yep. into 20 languages, so it's done good work for the kingdom. And I'm really proud of that, Dad. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and the, the impact that's had. Uh, my son, who's always been a little bit more cautious about these things, said, you know, <clears throat> Dad, it really hasn't affected my life that much. You didn't turn it into a career. I chose not to do what you've mm -hmm. done, and that has kind of created an organization as a part of my redemptive story. In yeah. my case, it was just putting my head down, raising my three kids, and teaching yeah. at a university and making life work. So but writing the book was a little bit more of a side show instead of kind of a main show for me, mm -hmm. a side ring, not the, not the, the, the center ring of my life. Which I think is important to note, by the way, Jerry, because I think a lot of people get pigeonholed into thinking, well, I see these other people do these other things and they kind of make something of their, but redemption happens in both of those. It arenas, does. That's right? exactly right, Davey. I, and well, that was the point my, my, my son was making. He said, I grew up in a normal home. Now, I, we didn't have mom around, but I was yeah. widowed and did not remarry for 20 years. And we just figured out how to be a family of four. In fact, we had a gathering mm -hmm. just last week with the whole family and kids were laughing a lot. Every summer we went to a national park and camp and backpack. Every summer we went to a Shakespeare festival for five mm -hmm. or six days we just learned how to do life. And he said that the book be, did not interrupt my life. Now, every once in a while, he says, especially as an adult, someone will say, Sitzer, are, are you related to Jerry? Or, uh, mm -hmm. oh, I've heard about your story or whatever. But he said it doesn't happen often enough uh, to, to really feel like it's an intrusion on my life. So that was the first thing. Yeah. Here's the other telling thing he said. He said, I think about mom every day. I really miss her a lot. That's never gone away. I've always had that kind of longing. But he said, here's the problem, Dad, is that I like my life as it is right now, too. And I can't have both. Hmm. Because my life is unfolded in the wake of the fact that Mom and Dinah Jane and Grandma died. You'd wow. like it both ways, but you can't have it both ways. So he said, I'm wow. happily married. I love my wife. I love my home. I love everything about what what's true in my life right now. Yeah. And all of that is at least in part a result of the tragedy. Whew. Now think about the irony of that. So he said, yeah. 
you, you, you've got to mourn the past and the loss that you suffered and the ending of that story. And mm. it's appropriate to keep mourning that for the rest of your life. You don't get over right. that. You can grow into it and carry it. You can't get over it. And yet be also present and attentive to the new story that's unfolding. Yeah. In his case, marrying Kelly and having now they just had a third baby uh, six weeks ago and and three children and so on and so forth. Or my marriage, what I call it, uh, Patricia, I call it uh, the first marriage, the second time around. Mm. So there's so much richness in our life story now. And part of that is a result of the fact that the other story ended. Yeah, yeah. So wow. I like the fact that he chose life, not the life he would have wanted, but the life that was imposed on him or by the circumstances imposed on him. And that seems mm. strikes me as a, as a really healthy way to live out tragedy. Yeah. You don't get over yeah. the old, but you're open to the new. Right. And I think one of the greatest travesties in whether it's someone from the outside looking in on stories of tragedy like yours or, or mine, or whether it's someone who's trying to live one out is that you tend to think that those are mutually exclusive concepts that, that you, you either have to hang on to the old or live out the new. You can't hold the two in tension. And you have to hold them in tension. And actually that creates in us a profound capacity that has to be developed in the human person. You know, Dave, yeah. you were made in the image of God. We have amazing capacity. As the Psalm 8 says, we're made a little lower than God himself. Hmm. We're, we're the, the, the quintessential example of God's creative power. We're superior to the angels. We're amazing. We're also fallen. We're both at the same wow. time. And life experience tends to gnaw away the ugly stuff and provide us with the circumstances to grow beauty in us, beauty out of ashes. Hmm. And it increases the capacity we have in our souls to know God, to imitate God, to live out a story of redemption and so on. But we have to hmm. learn to live in those tensions. That's another point that has really become clear to me over the years is our capacity to live in tension. Now, I tell yeah. this story in this one of the new chapters, but it was very meaningful to me. 18 months ago, uh, I get up. I always get up very, very early in the morning, about 530. It's just in my gene pool, I guess. And <laughs> went out, uh, made a cup of coffee. Uh, that's what gets my wife out of bed is coffee. And uh, was sipping, yeah, went too. out and got the <laughs> uh, newspaper in the morning. Yes, that tells you my age because I still get a physical newspaper. <laughs> and... <laughs> and, uh, and then noticed Venus in the morning sky. Um, it was really strutting its stuff. It was beautiful. It looked like a small moon. It was so big and so bright mm. and so glorious, hanging there in the morning sky, dominating the skyline. And I just stared at it for a while with a sense of deep wonder. Went back to my uh, favorite chair, had my morning devotions, and sipped on my coffee. And kind of breathed this sort of sigh of pure pleasure that I had been exposed to something just so extraordinary in the heavenly bodies, you know. That mm -hmm. afternoon, I got a call from my sister who told me the story of my great nephew who had come to Whitworth to play football that fall, got a pain in his leg, MRI, uh, MRI had an MRI taken, discovered it was osteosarcoma, bone cancer. Mm. And uh, the diagnosis came in that day. So she called me and said, this is really bad news. And um, six weeks later, he lost his leg mid-thigh, went through horrific chemo, wow. cancer spread. I did his memorial service just this past February. Mm. He died at 19 years old. Okay, so here's the metaphor, Davey. Venus in mm. the morning sky and a telephone call about osteosarcoma in a young man. That's the world we live in right there. That's the tension of life that all of us experience. And as yeah. you grow in Christ, and as you face the losses that you experience, that tension grows, but so does your capacity to be present 
to both. So you can wow. be both sorrowful and joyful. You can mm. face the tumult of life, in my case, raising three little kids, highly traumatized, and yet somehow move toward peace. Both are possible. Mm. Wow. Wow. You know, the, you know, there's another tension that you kind of bring up quite a bit in, in the book and you, you had to wrestle with it. I've had to wrestle with it. It's the tension of the, it's the theodicy, right? Yeah. It's the idea that yeah. there's pain and suffering that exists in this world. And yet God is all powerful and all loving, you know? And of course the circular questioning that ends up saying, well, if he's all loving, then why would he allow this yeah. to happen in my life? I'm sure you got that question many times, yeah, I still do. right? I get that so many times. Yeah. Um, but if he's all powerful, you know, why did he not stop this? Um, yeah. You know, a, a, as you hold those two things in tension, what 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 have you made of that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I still struggle with it. I'm not sure there is an answer that is entirely satisfying. So yeah. I'm going to go on a little bit of a riff here. Yeah. Um, one of the most useful exercises that I followed, Davey, was this one. Okay, so let's just say that um, you determine God's job description as God. And every time mm -hmm. something bad happens, you say, well, God, if you were really God, that wouldn't have happened because you're, all, you're good and you're loving and you're all powerful and therefore all bad things shouldn't happen. Yeah. So uh, you want to reverse that event. Uh, your wife now is alive again, and my wife is too, and my daughter and my mother. And then uh, something else bad happened six months later. Well, if, if God were God, he wouldn't have allowed that to happen too. And then something else, if God were God. In other words, what you really want is a perfect life. And by right. perfect, you mean incomplete control, which mm. is really a way of saying, Davey, you want to be God. You don't want right. God to be God. You want to be God, and you want to boss him around and tell him what to do. Hmm. And there is a word we use for that place when we are in charge, and it's called hell. Hmm. Wow. In hell, people get exactly what they want without God. Wow. Wow. I love Lewis's description, actually, of hell, where he yeah. says, uh, you get your way, you get what you want, and you're totally alone. You get to be yeah. God of your own world, and you're the only one there. And when I think yeah. about being alone for eternity, it is the most terrifying thing that I can think of. Right. So following right. that trail of logic is if, if I operate under the assumption that God is really God only when I get my way. Hmm. I follow that trail and it leads me all the way to hell. So wow. I think, no, that's not an answer here. Yeah. Um, so instead, I, I think differently about this, <clears throat> that we live in a fallen world and the world is broken and full of tragedy and sorrow and hurt. And that fall came about because we rejected uh, God's plan to be his vice gerunds, to be his creatures on earth, his image bearers, and to imitate him and follow him. And we chose to try to play God ourselves, and it catapulted yeah. the entire creative order into utter disaster. But God has now set in motion a plan to redeem this story and to redeem the people that he's made in his image. Right. But that story of redemption involves pain. There's just no way around it. It involves pain. Yeah. Uh, we can respond to pain either by shaking our fist at God for the rest of our lives or realize maybe something else is going on here than meets the eye and mm. allow God to use that pain or that loss in a way that is profoundly redemptive and formational in our lives. In yeah. other words, loss and suffering grows us up. Wow. Davy, I wish there were another way, but there, <laughs> I I, <do> too. <laughs> there isn't. I mean, yeah. I wish there were another way of raising children. Yeah. But as you know, in raising children, pain and suffering is a part of the business. 
Not that I beat them. I obviously I wouldn't do that at all, but that's just the nature of reality in a fallen world. Yeah. And so, but but there's a second thing I want to say, and it has to do with how we view time. When we, when we, when we make God subject to our experience of time, And then we say something like, well, God has a purpose in this. We're really saying God caused this. But God is not subject to time in the same way we are. So God is as alive 100 years from now as he is now, and he's as alive 100 years in the past as he is now, all times Mm. at the present to God. So I tend to see God enveloping time, surrounding Mm. time. He, he's present to the outcome of the tragedy as well as to the tragedy itself. Mm. It all fits together in some kind of larger story, larger narrative. The best analogy I can come up with is a novelist who writes a novel. Well, the right. novelist has the whole thing in his or her brain before ever putting a pen, pen to paper. Uh, he could start or she could start writing the last chapter before the first chapter because the novelist transcends the time sequence of the novel itself. Well, God, all times are the present to God. Okay, so here's a great little story uh, that involved my my son, David. We're driving to Hmm. a soccer match, and he's about eight years old. He's very quiet. He tends to be quiet. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he says, "Um, do you think mom sees us? Hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is one of those moments. Yep. Stay with it, Jerry. Stay with it. Well, I said, um, why are you asking? And he said, well, um, <clears throat> if mom sees us and she's in heaven, how can she bear to see the pain we're in? Mm. He's eight, Davy. Wow. And he's thinking about these things. Never underestimate an eight-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Well, we talk about it a little bit. We're silent for a while. And I, I respond finally. This is a longer conversation this way. The reason why she can be present to our pain and witness it in heaven is because she also sees how the story is going to turn out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's grace that envelops the pain itself. Mm. Wow. Well, Jerry, this goes back to, you know, what you were saying earlier about seeing your story through narrative is, is it's imperative. Yeah. And it's not just, it's not just seeing your, your story through narrative, but it's also setting straight the, your, your worldview, the narrative of yeah. history, right? Mm-hmm. It's it, if you're going to see it through the lens, as you just described it, then you can begin to start to, to, you know, unpack and unravel your pain through the lens of God's story, as opposed to through the lens of your own logic or your own story. Well, I think you need to be aware of the stories, the narratives by which you operate could be a narrative of victimization, narrative of revenge, narrative of Mm. success. Life is good only when I'm successful, only when I get my way Uh, without always consciously thinking about it. In fact, I'm sure most of the time we don't think about it. We do, in fact, operate out of some narrative perspective. We make meaning in our lives Hmm. by interpreting what happens to us and what happens in the world around us from some kind of narrative perspective. It's often very self-defeating. Yeah. Um, When you step out of those narratives and step into the biblical narrative, then you begin to live in hope and expectation. That doesn't mean you have mm. everything figured out. Uh, here's a good example. I love the story of Joseph. It's one of my favorite for obvious yeah. reasons in the Bible. And uh, I'll give you the, the thumbnail. You know, Joseph is a young man. He's got uh, uh, 10 older brothers. He's the spoiled son and the favorite son of his father. His older brothers come to hate him. And uh, they finally find an opportunity to get rid of him. They're going to murder him, but uh, the eldest brother intervenes. And instead, they sell him uh, as, um, to a, a caravan of traders going down to Egypt. Uh, he's again sold in Egypt to um, the, uh, a wealthy man who is a member of the court of Pharaoh. 
And uh, the narrative tells us, the writer of the story tells us at this point that the Lord was with Joseph. Now, that's a, there's a little bitter irony to that because in Joseph's own immediate experience, where is he going to find evidence of God? He's yeah. just been betrayed by his brothers, sold as a slave, and now living in a foreign country as a servant in a, in a man's household. Well, his fortunes rise. He, he shows responsibility. He proves that he's a man of faith. Uh, then the, the man, Potiphar, his wife tries to seduce Joseph, and he holds her off and says, no, I can't do this to God or to my master. She runs to her um, husband and say, Joseph is trying to seduce me. In other mm -hmm. words, lies. Potiphar believes his wife and tosses him into prison. So now we have the betrayal of brothers, slavery, yeah. and imprisonment. And again, <laughs> the narrator has the audacity to say to us, the reader, and the Lord was with Joseph. <laughs> again, Joseph's uh, fortunes rise in prison, and he's there for years. Right. All right. Well, then, here's my favorite incident. One little paragraph. So being in prison for years, two of Pharaoh's court officials are tossed into prison for some impropriety. One mm -hmm. is the baker, and the other is the, uh, the steward. I call him the butler. The baker <laughs> and the butler. And they both have dreams in prison. And they yeah. look around at all their fellow prisoners and say, we're so confused by these dreams that nobody can make sense of them. Joseph steps forward and says, well, my God can give me the ability to interpret dreams. He hears both the yeah. dreams. He interprets them correctly. Bad news for the baker. He loses his head. But the butler is restored to his position of power in Pharaoh's court. And just before he's released from prison, Joseph <laughs> says this, remember me when you appear mm. before Pharaoh again. Now, I want you to step into this story, J Davey, and think yeah. what's going on in Joseph's head. He's thinking, mm -hmm. the almighty God, whom I've been trusting now for years, yeah. in horrible circumstances, has finally given me my ticket out. Mm. Thank God. So he's got this narrative constructed in his brain of how things are going to turn out. And the butler forgets. <laughs> two more years and I'm thinking at that point Joseph has probably faced the crisis of his life because yeah. the narrative he constructed in his head was such that this was going to be his way out of this horrible set of circumstances yeah okay now mm. if Joseph had gotten his way then and there it might have been good for Joseph but for nobody else uh, there would have been no uh, restoration to Pharaoh's court. There would have been no no one in charge to handle the the, the plenty and the famine. Yep. There would have been no restoration yep. with his father and his brothers. It mm. would have been a narrative that would have only fit Joseph's purpose and served his interest. He right. had to wait. Right. And then, of course, as you know, Pharaoh has a dream. And I love this line. He begins to ask all his advisors, can you make sense of this? Nobody can. And then the butler steps forward and says, oh, I remember my faults today. Well, yeah, yeah I, I should hope so. There was a man <laughs> in prison, a Hebrew, he says. Hmm. And he had the power to interpret dreams. Well, you know how the story ends up. Yeah. And all yeah. of a sudden now, yeah. look what happens. A chain reaction of reconciliation and restoration that affects an entire nation and a family yeah. system. Yeah. So when wow. we live in a, a redemptive narrative, the biblical narrative, that doesn't mean we have it all figured out. We are often traveling blind, but we do mm. have stories, don't we, Davey? Like the Joseph yep. story yep. or the Esther story or the youth, uh, Ruth story. And of course, the, the redemptive story, the Jesus story yeah. that reminds us that even when we're traveling blind, God is somehow in this narrative. Yeah, so good. And good sure. is going to come from it, even if it's not the good that we designed in our imagination, as Joseph did when right. he interpreted the dream of the butler. Right, right. Well, and what's so amazing about it, too, is you see the the butler kind of, it occurred to him, oh, right? I mean, that's <laughs> completely God's timing, completely God's 
that's right. You know, hand that's causing this epiphany to happen at you know at exactly the right time. I mean, he did remember Joseph. It was just two years later. It was just two years later, right? And yeah. and I look at it in some ways, Jerry. I've looked at that situation where Joseph goes, "Hey, remember me," almost as a resignation that now maybe I can't trust God. Maybe I need to take this into my own hands a little that's bit. That's right. Yes. Uh-huh. And drop this seed here and try to manipulate the process. And it was like, I kind of look at it in, in some ways. And, you know, again, we're all interpreting these things a little bit differently as we peer into it. But we go, maybe that's why God had to leave him in the prison for another couple of years. Because yeah. it wasn't, he didn't have the full trust yet to say, I trust you with my story, God, to work this out. Or, or the alignment of circumstances that turned yeah. this story from a nice story that would have been forgotten in history. True. An amazing story. Right. I mean, you think about the Ruth story. Yeah. Uh, rural r- rural um, Palestine during, uh, I mean, th- there's nothing about that story that's significant. Right. It's, right. it's not memorable at all, except for the fact that Boaz, a generation hmm. older than Ruth, they marry and they have a son and he has a son and that son happens to be the king of Israel and many right. generations later, Another son is born who, oh, my goodness, just happens to be the savior of the world. King of kings. Wow. We just don't see it all. We never no, see we it all, Davey. And that's why we have to function at least partly by faith. And yeah. it means sometimes we're going to be weaned from our attachment to these redemptive narratives that we construct yeah. in our brains. Now, in my case, you know, I'm thinking two or three years after the accident, well, maybe it's time for me to remarry. Mm. And it didn't happen. Not for 20 years. And then all my kids were gone from the home. Well, then ironically, I finally meet a lovely woman, Patricia, and her two daughters just happened to be really good friends of my two sons. Who could have made that up? Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Yeah. That's the that's the beauty of the the story writing of God. That's why I love your that that you see it and you talk about it through story. That's one of the things we talk about so much because you you can't understand story until you kind of get to the end. And that's the benefit of having some of these narratives that we can draw from some of these stories from scripture. And, 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 you know, when we could look at like your life and you're telling these stories and you can look back on it and you can say, well, let me show you some of these breadcrumbs of redemption that the Lord has left through the whole thing. I mean, I look at Joseph's story and I go, well, I can see what benefit there was for him to be in Potiphar's house. And then the duties that he was given, the responsibilities he was given to, for, for, you know, responsible over the rations in prison, he, that was building blocks for him to be able to put, All of be it. put at second command and he, to save he the, had, you know, people. Yeah. And he had no idea, no idea, no idea yeah. how this would be useful later on, which is a good, a good argument for why we need to be attentive to what is immediately at hand. There's more going right. on than meets the eye. And we just have to be awake mm. to it, attuned to it. Augustine, um, I mean, I'm a church historian, so I'm going to do this kind of thing from time to time. But yes, uh, Augustine, <laughs> I appreciate that so much. In one of his or one of his essays um, that there really is, the past and future do not, in fact, exist. Now mm. you think, well, wait a minute, that's crazy. No, he said, logically, um, y- y- the past is done. It doesn't exist anymore. It exists in the present only as a consequence from past things or as a memory. The future doesn't exist. It hasn't happened yet. The future exists only as an expectation and a hope. So he put it this way. The present of the past is memory. The present of the present is attentiveness. The present of the future is expectation. So it is so important that armed with a kind of hope and faith, we're as attentive to the present moment as we can possibly be Hmm. because it's the only moment we have. Wow. If we pine away at a lost past or are constantly imagining and constructing a particular kind of future, we are actually becoming less and less attentive to the present. And that's the only time we have. Wow. So it's become really important in my own life story to be as attentive to what is immediately at hand. When I'm with a grandchild, I've got 11 of them now. Or when I'm in a conversation with you, Davey, or I'm reading a book, or I'm taking a walk, or I'm meeting with a pastor and mentoring them. Or when I'm alone, uh, I'm 
I'm trying to be attentive to the only time I have, which is right now, hmm. with a kind of hope that God is in this, even though I can't see it. Once in a while, we get bigger glimpses. I mean, wow. your your second wedding is a, is a bigger glimpse. Yeah, yeah. But then you come down from the mountain and you're back yeah. in the valley and it's cloudy and you, you're working out life and raising yep. kids and raising money or doing whatever you have to do when... Hmm. The sky is not so open. Yeah. And then you have another moment again when the sky is, is bigger and more open. Wow. In the case wow. of Joseph, sometimes we have an open sky and we misread it. <laughs> we yep. think we get it and we don't. Wow. What I'm hearing you say is it's not... It's not that we're not supposed to be reflective or nostalgic about the past. And it's not that we're not supposed to be future oriented or, you know, exactly having a vision for the future. But it's that the present right now, it we, it's the balance of it, right? It's the we've got to make sure that the scales are tipped more toward just living out the present. Yeah. <clears throat> but I mean, Augustine uh, meant, meant it this way. So I have no control over the past. I can't change anything. Yeah. My greatest power is how I remember it. Wow. Okay, so I know people who remember the past in an idealized way. I'll never be happy again. Hmm. I lost this child or lost my job or lost my health. And that was the ideal. And so for the rest of my life, I'm going to have second or third or fourth best. That's bad memory. That's memory that disempowers us. Memory that assigns us to a life of misery. Wow. Um, a better memory is to say, I can't change the past, but I can be attentive to how that past is carrying over into the present and how I can live in ways that are meaningful and rich. So memory is a muscle. Hmm. How we remember something is actually different from the event itself. Wow. So we have power over how we remember things and whether we can remember them from a kind of redemptive perspective. Uh, when it comes to the future, we can't live in the future, but we can live with hope about the future. And that actually sends us right back into the present again. Man. Wow. I live more purposefully. I live more hopefully in the present instead of being so preoccupied with the future that hmm. we we dream about it. But then we never we're never sent back into the present to live differently in light of our hope and expectation about the future. Wow. Wow. Yeah, because if we're honest, so it's a lot not of... that we live, it's not that we live for the moment. That's irresponsibility. Yeah. It's a that's a foolish 16-year-old that's yeah. drink, who drinks too much. It's a good distinction. It's that we live in the moment. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. We live in the moment for something bigger than even time itself. Correct. Right. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, um, man, I hope everybody who is listening to this right now, they're, we're, we're all going to have to go back and like rewind it and listen to it some more. And <laughs> this is beautiful, Jerry. Um, I want to talk a little bit about community because that's the other that's the other pillar that you kind of bring forward in this, you know, this new release this 25 year anniversary release of Grace Dis Disguise is, is community, because we have a lot of people in our community who are asking questions about community. And unfortunately, Jerry, um, unfortunately, it's through the lens of I'm having trouble finding good, strong community within my church community. Yeah. Because I'm experiencing something. My life experience right now, it doesn't seem like there is a space that, that they can hold a space for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I know you've got a lot to say about that. What well, what are your thoughts on? Well, I'll begin by saying it, it is a problem for a couple of reasons. Um, most people are good for the short term. And I don't mean that negatively because it includes you and me. Yeah, right. Uh, I'm good at sending the card, having one cup of coffee, dropping a meal off, whatever it happens to be. But then I return to life as normal Yeah. again. Uh, one of Patricia's best friends uh, and her husband uh, just lost a 37-year-old two weeks ago in a motorcycle accident. Mm -hmm. Married's got a four-year-old. And they live, what, a quarter mile from us. And so we're seeing them pretty regularly. And 
in this case, we have looked at each other in the face and realized this is going to be one of the long haul ones. Yeah. Uh, dropping off a meal is not going to be enough. Yeah. We're too close to them. So uh, there are a lot of people who are good for the short term stuff. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, because we only have so much capacity to carry the sorrow of other people long term. Right. The other thing that's really exacerbated uh, the, this whole uh, set of circumstances, I think, in the last two years, but really much longer, is the increasing isolation and loneliness in American society. Yeah. Um, uh, Obama's attorney general uh, wrote a book, uh, and it came out a few years ago, I think pre-COVID, actually. Mm. And he said that um, that the modern, the, the greatest malady in the modern world is loneliness. Hmm that our level of isolation is utterly profound. They've done some research on this. They'll interview somebody and say, uh, who are the people you can call if you f land in an emergency room and you need to ride home? And a surprisingly high percentage of people say, I don't know who I'd call. Wow. So that's one of a number of things they've done to try to discern the level of isolation and loneliness in people's lives. Yeah. Well, I would, I would say this. I, I think we welcome the gestures of a larger group of people when we've gone through some kind of big loss. Mm. The meal, the card, whatever, including the inept things that they are inevitably going to say. Right. I think we need to be generous. I mean, we've all said stupid things. Yeah, yeah. And nobody knows what to say or what to do anyway. Right. Uh, in the wake of some kind of big loss. Yeah, even you and I, who some people would say like, oh, you have to be an expert on loss, right? We still don't know what to say. Oh, no, a lot. I mean, right? the best thing to say is I'm sorry and then shut up. Exactly. Or get them to begin telling stories themselves, but yeah. not not give answers. There are no answers. That's right. Or better put, there are answers, but it takes a long time to grow into them mm. and to make them your own. That's right. So an answer as we define it is, um, uh, is not particularly appropriate early mm. on, especially in, in loss. Uh, in the experience of loss, whatever it happens to be. Uh, I'm going to add uh, to that, though, that we as people who've gone through loss need to take responsibility to build a team. Mm. Sometimes that's really natural, and we'll have our friends take the initiative. I had four or five colleagues at Whitworth University within weeks after the accident surround me and say, Jerry, we're in this for the long haul with you. And Davey, we've been meeting almost every week. For 30 years. Wow. Okay. Now that's unusual. That's very unusual. But I have some unusual friends. I feel yeah. like I'm appointed now to do that for other people, to be at least in a few circumstances, mm -hmm. that long haul person. So sometimes it happens pretty naturally. At other times, it doesn't happen naturally. Let's just say you, you, you recently moved. Yeah. And you're in a community and they're all strangers to you. Well, then you have to think, okay, what can I do here to build a team of people who are really going to be my, uh, my support group over the long haul without taxing any one person too much? Hmm. You might ask an older person, would you meet with me once a month and mentor me? Uh, maybe find a therapist, uh, join a small group, meet with a pastor and ask not the pastor to do it, but... Do you have two or three people you know of who could really be supportive of me because I just don't have that community at my disposal in a kind of natural way? Yeah. In other words, we have to take some initiative, Davey, because right. we cannot, we cannot do this alone. Hmm. It, it loss, it can be profoundly isolating. You feel oh, yeah. self-conscious. You feel exposed. You feel different. Well, you are different. Hmm. And so there are times when we must take the initiative. Wow. And maybe that provides some explanation as to why so many of us feel isolated, especially after experiencing loss, is that I've, as far as I've experienced anecdotally, most people are waiting on the church or someone else to take the initiative yeah. to come in and step into their loss. And when that doesn't happen, then they feel this even, you know, even they're increasingly aware of the void or the vacuum that's there. Yeah, once of, in a while, once in a while, someone will take the initiative who uh, say has gone through a big loss. Yeah. 
I'll even do that on occasion. Not very often, actually, Davey, but if I know someone a little bit better, just because of the nature of my own life experience, I feel like it's kind of a duty at the local level right? Uh, to meet with people. Sometimes it's only once or twice. Sometimes it's much, much longer, uh, depending on the nature of the, the circumstances. Uh, and I'm sure you do the same thing mm-hmm. where you started a whole organization to be able to do this. Yeah, but even so in that, Jerry, we benefit as... from other people's initiative. Right. Sometimes we've got to take it ourselves and build a team for the long haul. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what I, what I was going to say right there is that even in that, I still have to figure out what's my capacity personally, you know, yeah. outside of the organizational structure and the systems that we put in place to serve people and help people and the other people that we employ and delegate to, to serve people and help people. What does that look like for me? And I think that's a question that everybody has to ask themselves as well and kind of gauge their capacity as well as gauge, even just like the conviction, right? The, yeah. where's the Holy spirit saying, Hey, this is a long haul person. This is someone yeah. you need to walk with. Yeah. And and I think that everybody's, you know, we should all, I think it's part of the, the Christian experience, a life with Jesus to have that for a few people, but we can't have it for everybody. We don't have the capacity for it. It requires discernment, a life of prayer to determine your appropriate role. You know, you have an organization. In my case, I wrote a book. I do get a lot of mail. Mm. I've had thousands of emails, letters, and calls over the years, you know, and I will not carry on long-term correspondence with people. Uh, eventually, I'll encourage them to find somebody local, uh, that that's beyond what I'm able to do. I do respond to everything I receive. Yeah. And um, with a word of advice or a thank you or whatever, whatever's required in the moment. Hmm. Uh, there are some people who have gone through losses where I've been uh, right on the, it, it, at, in the front row because it was appropriate. Right. We have to be discerning and trust the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, to determine what our proper role is. But if we're if the we're the ones who've gone through the loss, somewhere along the line, we have to look around us and say, "Okay, who who are the people who I'm going to be able to turn to, not yeah. just in the next week, but the next year, or in some cases, the next decade." Mm, wow. So, you know, my good friend, Ron and Julie, good friends, Ron and Julie Powell were, were that couple. She was a good friend of Linda's and he was a colleague at Whitworth with me. And they just were so profoundly loyal and good to me over the years mm. with child care, with advice giving, with just shared life, shared life. Wow. And uh, Ron was involved in my wedding uh, 12 years ago when I remarried after all those years of widowhood. They were like, spouses to me in a strange kind of way during those years of widowhood. Uh, six years ago, Ron's wife died, Julie died of cancer. Oh man! And my wife and I met with him every week, every week. We still do every week. Two years ago, I did his wedding. Wow. Now that's long haul relationship yeah, right there, Davey. And we're blessed. I know that it's an unusual set of circumstances, but we have to exercise some responsibility to figure out how to put that team together. Yeah, that's true. So that we uh, have people who are holding us. Wow. You, know, you keep saying that though, Jerry, that's an unusual set of circumstances, but it does. Isn't that sad that that is the case, it right? Like I feel like it, I feel like maybe in the past it used to not be as unusual, but for whatever reason, maybe it's, yeah. a co- I'm sure it's a combination of a lot of different things, right? You know, yeah. I mean, I think just the, the globalization of, of our world now we're, we're so we have access to just about everything that we could. We're so connected and to everybody. each other technologically, but we all, again, we're feeling increasingly isolated and yeah, we know a lot of people and we know no one at the same time. Wow. Yeah. With Instagram and Facebook yeah. and, and, uh, and Twitter and so on, our level of connectedness is vast. The level of depth has been lost. Mm. And it's the loneliness. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. One of the things I appreciate about you is that you, even though you, your loss is one that if you were to put measures and weights on it, which again, I know you can't and shouldn't do that, right? But your your loss is extremely heavy. There are, most people have not experienced, especially in one fail swoop, in one moment, 
the amount of loss that you've experienced and yet you hold so much space for all different types of grief and and you know you're very um forthright about that in your in your book um you were you know i i feel like even as you were talking about letters that are coming in and stuff i'm sure you experience this phenomenon that happens where people say Hey, I know I haven't experienced anything to the level that you have, but, and then they share their story, right? Which, yeah. which tells me that, okay, they, they, they have in their mind some kind of scaling system, but then they also want to feel some validation or some solidarity. They want to, they want you to understand their story, which tells me that's really yeah. important to the human experience. Yeah. And so how do you hold that? Yeah, I mean, I why is that, that so important that we don't diminish other people's pain, that we really hold space for that? And how do you do that? Well, I, I, uh, the initial uh, uh, thought behind this uh, came to my mind when my my friends um, strongly encouraged me to write the book that became A Grace Disguise. They said, mm. we've been listening to you for three years now. We think your perspective is really fresh. You're a good writer. Mm. And I said, oh, no, that is I do not want to go in print. And they said, some things are not your choice. Hmm. some things you do as a matter of duty to the human community. And we feel like this is one of them. Wow. It's a good use of your gifts. You had a really big experience. You've got a platform. Um, and uh, circumstances, uh, kind of the kind of the con a convergence of circumstances yeah. are such that you need to take this seriously. Well, I wrote a first draft. I remember where everybody was sitting in my living room 25 years ago when we were talking about this first draft, I could name every person who was there. And I made my famous carrot cake and we were sipping on coffee and tea. And um, they said, they said great things, fresh, great theology, great perspective. And then there was this deafening silence. Hmm. And then one woman looked at me and said, but you're not in this book. And you have to be in it. You have to be in this book. Wow. And Linda and your mother, you've got to tell stories. It can't be theological. Wow. It's got to be somehow more autobiographical. Yeah. I call it now a theological memoir, yeah. like Augustine's Confessions, mm. although no one will ever get close to the brilliance of that book. <laughs> and I really wrestled because I didn't want to do it. I felt exposed. Yeah, yeah. But they were very clear. It's got to be that way or no way. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what inspired me to write the second chapter in what you're referring to, whose loss is worse, because I didn't want to use my experience as a kind of trump card to right. everybody else. Right. Here's the ace of spades. You think you've suffered. Well, you don't have any idea. Yeah. And so I began to think about losses and the variety of them and how they're all bad in their own way. I haven't experienced divorce. I don't know what it's like to suffer rejection. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had a terminal illness. I'm really healthy. Mm. I have never lost a job. I've never suffered unemployment. I mean, there are all kinds of losses that are irreversible. That's what I call them. Yeah. Irreversible losses that change the landscape of one's life. Mine was one kind of loss. I didn't, I didn't have to struggle with a two-year battle against cancer. Mm. I didn't lose my, my wife one drip at a time. Mm, yeah. I mean, it's just one kind of loss. It was horrible. Right. And it took a long time to get back on my feet. But I know a lot of people who've gone through horrible experiences that are very, very different from mine. And mm. I refuse to invalidate those. That's right. They may be more private. They may not look as big, but they still are. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So all loss is bad, just bad in different ways. What I call catastrophic or irreversible loss, such that the landscape of your life is permanently altered. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that the evidence of someone who is living out a narrative that is not a victim narrative, it's not a pity narrative, yeah. is someone who can hold space for other people's losses, no matter what degree those losses yes. are. Uh -huh. because Again, we're going back to our human capacity, aren't we? That's exactly right. Uh, if we're willing to face our pain, find grace in it, uh, our soul grows in its capacity to bear mm. the pain of other people. I mean, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they should be comforted. He didn't put it in the past tense, Davey. Right, right. 
You didn't say blessed are those who once who once were mourning. Yeah. But now they can be happy again. <laughs> <laughs> you said blessed are those who are mourning. I think mourning should be a lifestyle. Wow. We might not have uh, circumstances that that make us mourn. Yeah. But there's a lot in the world that is worthy of mourning. Mm. And it's our obligation as followers of Jesus to step into that. That's right. That's right. You know, it is what Romans 1, I think it says, that all creation is waiting for the day, oh. right, where he will make all it's of this. Groaning it's groaning in travail, yep. as if as if in childbirth. Childbirth. Wow. Yep. And we have to attune to the cry and the sigh That's right. and the groaning of the world. That's right. It's all around us. That's right. You know, there's something in us, Davey, that wants to live in a nice gated community. As a, <laughs> it's a metaphor. True. <laughs> the gated community, shut out the world. Yeah. I've got my nice property. I've got my swimming pool. Mm. I've got my good friends. I have my hobby. I have my happy marriage. Um, goodbye yeah. to the rest of the world. And God will simply not allow that. That's true. He calls us into the pain of the world. That's right. Yeah. And it's often our own pain that is that actually symbolizes that calling. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It provides the thrusters for us to step into other people's pain as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we get to experience the beauty, right? A gated, a gated yes. life is not a beautiful life. It's a hollow life. Uh, it's a hollow life. <laughs> and choice of words. and right. so, and so we get to experience beauty, but that beauty only comes, as you said earlier, the redemption only comes. It, it's, it, it is necessary that pain is a part of that story if we're going to yeah. experience redemption and beauty in it all. Yeah. And so that couple I referred to that lost their 37 year old son just two weeks ago in a motorcycle accident. Uh, we had dinner with them Tuesday night and uh, after dinner, or we sat outside in our backyard eating and there was, there was a level of, I don't even know what to call it pain and sweetness both mm. deep human connection profound affection uh it was it was holy it wow. was painful yeah and it was holy yeah and in its own strange kind of way beautiful yeah <laughs> oh how in the world do you hold those things in tension but you do right and as yeah, as we you can we are able to as our capacity has grown and and who God has created us to be in the image of him. Now, that's why I don't think you get over something. I think you grow into it. I love you learn that. To carry it better. I love that phraseology. You absorb Jerry. it. You absorb it into your soul. Yeah. And it becomes part of who you are as a human being. Yeah. It's so good, man. I wish we could sit and talk for hours about this. Um, and, well, and maybe we'll get the courage to ask you again for some more time later. Cause I would love to have some more time just to, I love that. I love what chat. you're doing, Davey. And mm. I love your own spirit and how your story is unfolding. Mm. And, um, I want to say when it comes to narratives again, I'll just say, you know, I, I was widowed for 20 years and, uh, I finally mm. arrived at the point it didn't take that long actually. For me to realize, no, I don't need to remarry to have this story be a good one. That's it. Yep. Uh, I did remarry. <laughs> Sake of my wife, <laughs> it drives her crazy. My sweet <laughs> Patricia, I'll say, I came to the point of recognizing remarriage is not going to solve a problem. It just creates a different kind of problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she said, Jerry, that sounds terrible. And then I smile and I laugh at her, you know. It's true. And it's I a mean, beautiful it's problem. Like, <laughs> right it's a beautiful problem but you know you can't you can't con construct a kind of trajectory right. for your life and then think the only way my life is going to be happy is under these set of circumstances that's so true yeah. that's so true i think that you know i say this often that redemption doesn't happen when god quote unquote restores to you what you lost redemption yeah. happens when you choose to partner with him to go help other people with what you've experienced. Oh, so wise, so well stated too. Yeah, that's exactly right. Hmm. You step into God's story. You don't say, tell God you've got to step into the, the one that I've constructed in my own brain. Right, right. Yeah, that's exactly, hmm. that's exactly right. And it's not going to turn out exactly as you uh, hoped and wished. I mean, by, back to the very beginning of our conversation with David said, uh, man, I, there's so much about 
that loss that I miss and I will for yeah. the rest of my life. It's a deep, deep ache in me. But then he paused and looked at me and said, but I love my life right now as it is. Mm. And we can't have it mm. both ways. Wow. Wow. Well, Jerry, this has been such a sacred time. We're going to make sure that everybody knows where to pick up the 25th anniversary edition of A Grace Disguise, as well as all yeah, of your other work. You, I mean, your other work is a, a, a well and a depth of wisdom and insight too. So all of these other books that you've written as well. So um, thank you for this time. This has just been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. Bless you in your work and marriage and in fatherhood. Mm, thank you. Hey friend, if you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe so that you can stay in the loop every time Nothing Is Wasted releases a piece of content here on this YouTube channel.